in our study in God's Word today. If you don't have a copy, raise your hand and we'll have an usher deliver one to you. I want to again say welcome to you all. It's good to have you here with us today. If you are new to the church family, if it's your first time or you're newer to our church family, you'll notice in the, the pew rack in front of you there are some visitor cards. Please take one, fill it out, let us know a little bit about yourself. There's a prayer request spot on there. Feel free to uh, write something in there, but it would be good for us to get to know you a little bit more, see how we can serve you. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Good to, good to have you here with us. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll open up God's Word. Lord God, again, just thank you for what we've been able to uh, go through so far today in singing and praying and, and celebrating mothers and saying thanks. And Lord, now as we turn our attention to your word, please do a mighty work in our hearts. Use this uh, historical account of Jesus and his disciples to uh, speak to our individual lives and situations. Uh, Holy Spirit, you are called our teacher by Jesus in the text here, so please teach us. We want to hear from you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you out there, we're switching now, switching gears. How many of you are fishermen? Any fishermen out there? Anybody? A few of us. Yes, I have my hand up there, not as an example, but for reality, because I am one too. If you are a fisherman, uh, you probably have at least one fishing story, probably many, and uh, probably a great fishing story. And some of you moms, you say, why are we doing a fishing story on Mother's Day? Well, you know, if you have fishermen in your life, you probably have the actual account of how big that fish was. You know, maybe you were there. I've got lots of fishing stories. I want to tell you one, and this one is true. This is not like the infamous how I got this scar uh, story that I told a few weeks ago. This one's actually true, at least to the best of my memory. Um, <clears throat> took place many years ago. I was about River's age, right around 10 years old. My family and I and my cousins, we were at Lake Powell, and uh, we were on a houseboat. And it was, it was kind of our practice as kids to, you know, cast out and then sit there and after about 30 seconds get bored. And we have this nice rail around the, the houseboat, so we just set our pole there and we go play and have fun. And my parents would say, hey, you shouldn't do that because you might actually catch a big one and it'll pull your pole into the water. We're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And all of a sudden I see from behind my mom telling me that my pole go like this and then <laughs> takes off into the water. I was devastated because that's what we did when we were there at Lake Powell. It was fishing. And so I'm thinking we've got a few days left and it's gone. All of a sudden my brother's pole starts to do the same thing. Thankfully my dad is there and he grabbed the pole and so we're thinking, you know, a school of big fish came by and ate up the bait and they're gone. Well, my dad begins to play this fish. And he just, he keeps reeling and reeling. And he's thinking, how much, how much line did this little guy cast out there? So he's, I'm going to see if I can get this fish to surface. And so he pulls up and as he does, the tip of my rod was coming up out of the water. You know, as a, as a little kid, you know, it's common to bust that last eyelet off of your pole because you're always running around and jamming it into the ground on accident. So I had done that. So I had, the, there was the top eyelet had broken off and the next eyelet down, when he pulled, you know, that thing came out of the water. My uncle grabbed it and he handed it to me and I continued, well, the, the hook on my brother's line hooked the last eyelet of that pole, of my pole. And so I took it and I reeled it in and uh, it ended up being about a 12 pound striped bass. I think 12 pounds. Um, I, again, that might be the fishing portion of the story. That <laughs> might be the unbelievable. But I remember holding this thing and you know, it was big to me as a little guy. And, uh, but how interesting that his hook caught the last eyelet on my pole and we were able to catch such a great fish. And maybe you have a fishing story, probably one that tops that or something, whether it's the size of the fish 
or the intensity of the scene or whatever the case is. I see Mitch back there, I think. Welcome back. You know, once went on a fishing trip and then with a guy who dunked me in the water. Oh, no, that was a baptism. <laughs> and that was planned, and we did that last year, uh, fishing guide. So maybe you have a fishing story like that. Well, several of Jesus' disciples had an experience during a fishing trip that surely outweighs any of ours. Their trip started out very poorly. They fished hour after hour after hour all night, catching absolutely nothing. Then some identified guy on the shoreline tells them what to do, and they end up catching one of the biggest catches they had ever experienced, ever seen. And then to top it off, once they got to shore, they were able to eat a gourmet fish breakfast cooked for them, served to them, and enjoyed dining with the Son of God himself. So truly, a fishing trip to remember. It's in John chapter 21. Go ahead and turn there if you're not there yet. As we saw last week, the previous passage, that's John 20, verses 30 and 31, is actually the, the conclusion to the main body of his writing. Uh, it gives his purpose for why he wrote this book. Immediately before that passage, we saw it a few weeks ago, it, he described the climactic example of a guy who saw everything. All that Jesus did. He heard all that Jesus said, but after the resurrection, he wanted proof. He was kind of being stubborn, and he said, I want proof that Jesus rose again. I want to see him with my eyes. I want to touch him with my fingers. That was, of course, Thomas. And Thomas was able to declare after seeing all the proof that Jesus was his Lord and his God. So you have that whole book, building, building, building to this climactic example in Thomas, and then he gives that purpose for why he wrote the book. He wrote it so that the reader may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing, having eternal life in Jesus. But remember structurally that John designed his book to have the main body of what he wanted to say, the sign miracles, all the statements, everything that he said, but he included bookends to this main body. There was the prologue, verses 1 through 18 of chapter 1, where he records kind of the prehistory introducing this Jesus, how he goes from being the timeless, eternal God, the creator God, entering into human flesh and beginning ministry. So he gives that pre that prologue and that prehistory. Then he jumps in to tell the story of Jesus and his ministry, this public ministry, his private ministry, and his passion. And then he concludes it there in 20, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, why he wrote the book. But then the other end of the book, he includes an epilogue, uh, a postlog, even though that's not really a term, but it's an epilogue where he ties together some loose ends that would otherwise leave us hanging and reveals some principles for us to apply until Jesus' second coming, yet in the future. And so in this final chapter of John, this epilogue, he records, he begins by telling this fishing trip to remember, where, among other things, Jesus reconstructed a scene that was similar to the one in which he initially called these men to be his full-time disciples and where they would leave their nets in their boat and they would no longer be fishermen, but they would be fishers of men. So we have him tell that story. Of course, in this epilogue, he records the restoration of Peter and he also records this command that we follow him. So a lot of good stuff here in this final chapter and epilogue to the book. So over the course of this chapter, we're going to get a glimpse of ourselves as disciples uh, as it relates to fishermen, being fishers of men, how uh, we are to be like shepherds, uh, how we are to take care of Jesus' people around us, 
and how are we are to be disciples with that command to follow him. So there's a, a lot of good information here in this final chapter. But let's go ahead and read John 21, verses 1 through 14, and you'll see some of these details that really do make this a fishing trip to remember. Starting in verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he, was, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when, Pete, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it, and bread so Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So as we notice there in verse 14, just to point this out, this is the third record John gives of Jesus appearing to his disciples after the resurrection. We saw that first appearance was to all the disciples minus Thomas on Resurrection Sunday evening. And then his second appearance, according to John, was a, was a week later, the following Sunday night, with Thomas present. And then we have this being the third, maybe another couple of weeks displaced after that, but of course before Jesus' ascension into heaven. And so let's begin uh, just by looking at verses 1 and 2 where John gives the setting of where all of this takes place. In verses 1 and 2, he tells us the place they were and the people that were there. First of all, the place, the Sea of Tiberias. <laughs> Another name for this is the Sea of Galilee, more commonly known to us as the Sea of Galilee. That body of water had many names throughout history, but same, same location. Keep in mind, uh, this body of water for our thinking is more like a lake to us than what we would think of as a sea. It's a body of fresh water fed by the Jordan River and also some, some springs that come up from the lake's floor. For those of us who went on the missions trip last summer to Bear Lake, to Garden City, you can think of it being kind of similar, in fact, to Bear Lake, uh, similar in dimensions and, and all of that. So uh, kind of give or take, it's like that. Interesting facts about this Sea of Galilee, it's 700 feet below sea level, largest, uh, lowest of the large freshwater lakes. It's roughly 150 deep at its deepest point. It's about 13 miles long, north and south, and then about eight miles at its widest place, uh, east to west. These conditions make it actually an excellent fishery and so there was, you know, back in that day, you could say, uh, commercial fishing. It was quite prevalent on the lake. It's about 60 miles north of Jerusalem to kind of give you an idea of where it is on the map. But it was here at the 
the, the uh, Sea of Galilee, actually, if you, if you think about the eastern side, the hillsides, is where Jesus took loaves and fish and fed the 5,000. Uh, it was later that same night that Jesus came down and actually walked on this body of water out to meet the disciples. And so this was a very well-known place for Jesus and his disciples. And this is where the disciples, before they began to follow Jesus, where a number of them had their fishing business. Uh, we see that it was in part a family fishing business, and then they also had partners. We'll see that when we look at Luke 5 later. So it was a big operation that some of these disciples had. Jumping into verse 2, we find the people that were there. It says Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, and John. Those are the two sons of Zebedee. And two other unnamed disciples there. We don't know who the other disciples were or why John doesn't include their names. Evidently, it's not relevant to the story, but we can speculate. Maybe it was Philip, the good friend of Nathaniel. Maybe it was Andrew, Peter's brother. We don't know, but we know there were seven disciples. And some might wonder, well, why are they up in Galilee? What are they doing up there? Weren't they just in Jerusalem at the end of chapter 20? If you're thinking of where they were traveling, they were just down in Jerusalem in the south. Remember, a lot of these guys were from up north in Galilee. In fact, it even says here that Nathanael was from Cana of Galilee, where Jesus had done that first sign miracle of turning water to wine. So many of them being from up there, that's where their former fishing business was, their families were. They had gone down in the weeks before to celebrate Passover, but now we're a few weeks, several weeks past that. So they had gone back up north to where they were from. We also learn in Mark 14, 28, <clears throat> Mark 16, 7, Matthew 28, verse 10, that Jesus referenced that at some point he would meet them in Galilee. So they knew that they were to go back up there. In fact, in Matthew 28, 16, they were supposed to meet him at a designated mountain in Galilee which kind of makes you wonder what they're doing on a lake at this point. But nonetheless, we might talk about that here in a few moments. But they are there <clears throat> up north. That's the setting of this story. Let's move on to see verses 3 through 14, the story itself, what all happened. First of all, we notice that Peter went fishing. Jesus had been crucified, buried, and now risen from the dead for a few weeks it appeared that maybe things had begun to slow down. They hadn't been baptized by the Holy Spirit yet. That doesn't happen until Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. And so and they, they didn't have Jesus with them every moment, uh, physically present with them. And so we get the idea that maybe things began to slow down for a moment. Maybe they kind of didn't have great direction at this point. And so we envision them kind of sitting down in some inactivity, and Peter says, guys, I'm going fishing. And we notice that many of the other men followed right along. Most of them were fishermen, too, by trade, so they all jumped into this little boat and headed out. Maybe you've never thought too much about this and wondered, why did they go fishing? And was this okay for them to do, or was this a problem? You know, when we think of guys sitting around with not a whole lot to do, and one of them says, I'm going to go fishing, you know, you envision them picking up their fishing rod, and uh, maybe they get the bait or whatever if they're lure, maybe they get on their raft and their fly rod, and off they go. But it's for fun or leisure or sport, or maybe they want to have a fish fry with their buddies or whatever the case is. But it's something more fun or sport-like. It's a pastime. That's not the story with these guys. Keep in mind, these guys were fishermen by trade before coming to know Jesus Christ. They weren't getting their rod and reel and their fishing vest and their waders and heading out for, or maybe their little lawn chair and kicking back to pass the time. Now this is them in essence, going back to work. Uh, remember the first time that Jesus called these guys formally. He had interacted with them a little bit before this time, but that first moment when he called them to follow him, to put everything down and follow me full time, 
a lot of them, it was at this same lake and through the same type of miracle. But these guys are now saying, I'm going fishing. Perhaps Peter, in light of the fact that his last memory with Christ, aside from this post-resurrection appearance or two, is the fact that he had denied Christ three times. And Jesus wasn't there physically present with them a whole lot. And uh, he didn't have a whole lot of insight. And the Holy Spirit had not yet baptized him into the body of Christ. Maybe he's thinking to himself, maybe I just need to go back to what I know best. Maybe I just need to go back fishing. Whether you look at it as right or wrong, again, you might say, look, these guys, they needed to provide for themselves and for their families, so this is just them filling the time with something productive. Well, we couldn't call it productive based upon the story, but maybe they were filling their time with something. Whether you look at Peter as doing right or wrong in this, he was supposed to be out telling people about Jesus being a fisher of men, Instead, he's isolating himself with the disciples out on a boat in the middle of a lake, getting involved in commercial fishing again. So, definitely not doing what he should have been doing, at least in my opinion. Uh, but even if you say, ah, he's doing okay. Well, this first night back on the job was not a good night. <laughs> For we notice that they were skunked. Skunked, that's a fishing term. That means you caught nothing. These guys got skunked. They fished all night with their boats, with their nets, and they didn't catch even one fish. Realize these are skilled fishermen. They weren't using a hook and a line. They weren't out there trying to find where are the fish biting. Not like you and I may go fishing and come out with nothing and you say, well, that's fishing. That's why we call it fishing, not catching. You know, whatever you use to justify and calm your own heart for getting skunked. But this is not the story with these guys. These guys are out on boats using nets. I've read about the fishing techniques of people around this time period when they used boats and nets. And they would almost always catch at least something. They'd go offshore a ways, they'd drop their nets into the water, which were weighted on one side and floating on the other side. They would put them in, and then depending on how big the net is, they would circle the boats and try to make noise and drive the fish in, or they'd set them out and just leave it and let the fish get, swim in and get stuck in the nets. They would always catch something. And from what I can gather about the Sea of Galilee, one of the main fish they would have pursued was a variety of tilapia. You go, ah, you know what that is. They sell them in stores around here. Perhaps a different variety, but they have a variety of tilapia there in the Sea of Galilee. Those are, those are known as St. Peter's fish. But they existed in abundance in this fishery, and so surely you have skilled fishermen all night, hours upon hours and upon hours of fishing, using nets, and yet they catch nothing. It's not far-fetched to say that part of this miracle is the fact that these professional fishermen, with all the necessary skill, all the know-how, all the tools of the trade, spending an entire night of fishing, and yet not even one was caught. It's almost as if God is reminding them through their failed efforts that this is not what you're supposed to be doing in life. What are you doing out here all night? Uh, part of the miracle, perhaps. But this is an incredible illustration for us of the failure that we experience apart from doing what God wants us to do with His enablement. These men were to be apostles of Jesus Christ. They were to be catching men. They're doing the opposite here. They're not going out and spreading out. They're gathering together, isolating themselves on a boat in the middle of a lake, going back fishing for a living. That's not what God wanted them to do. Therefore, God did not bless their work. Just a month earlier in the text, about a month earlier, the night Jesus was betrayed, as they were making their way from the upper room to the garden, they stopped by that vineyard. And what did Jesus tell them in John 15, 5? He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. 
He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. These men weren't abiding. As a result, they weren't bearing any fruit because they were acting apart from God's will. They were accomplishing nothing. I think this has the ability to really hit home in our lives, for at times we can feel similarly. Either we are doing something that God has not led us to do, or we're going forth purely in our own strength. And after long hours or days or weeks or months or years of striving, we come up empty. God has said, I want this for your life, and you know what he has said and what you have learned, and yet you've decided to take a different path. Now, he may let us take that path for a while, but then in grace and mercy, he may keep us from prospering in it. Or maybe it's something that we prosper for just a little while, but we would say, but I find no satisfaction or joy or anything out of this. It's like I'm going forth with all this effort and I'm coming up empty. That's these guys at this moment. I think it's something good for you and for me to be praying about in our own lives if we're feeling like we're coming up empty with something. Well, these men are getting an intense taste of this. But notice now what happens in verse 4. Jesus confronted them from the shore. As day was breaking, he called them Uh, called to them from the shoreline. He knew they didn't have anything. Perhaps he's the reason they didn't have anything. And he calls out to them. He already knows the answer. Children, you do not have any fish, do you? (laughs) And they replied with the honest but embarrassing, nope, you fishermen, you know of that moment when the guy comes by, hey, how's it going? You catching anything? No, (laughs) a little embarrassment. Uh, And even if you are catching something, you know, you don't want to give too much information. Otherwise, they might come and fish your your spot and use your your, uh, tactics. But these guys, they were just honest. No. You mean professional fishermen fishing all night with all the right gear, with all the know-how, with all of this, and you're coming up with nothing? Hmm. It's interesting that they didn't recognize Jesus. Why? Again, it doesn't say. Some possible thoughts. I think this first one is clear. Evidently, they were not expecting to see Jesus. He was not on their minds at the moment. They had their minds on other things. Secondly, it says they're about 100 yards from shore, and maybe depending on how much uh, Jesus was dressed and covered, it might be difficult to identify someone clearly from that far away. Third, it says that day was breaking, so maybe it was still very early, very low light. Maybe there was a mist. And of course, as we've seen at other times, perhaps Jesus was supernaturally concealing his identity for his purpose. Any or all of these things may have come into play, but the uh, big unfortunate fact of the matter is is that they were not living every moment ready to see him when he had said, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. I'm going to meet you on a mountain in Galilee. They knew that, but yet they weren't focused in on that. I think you and I live in a similar situation today. Jesus could come back at any moment. Are we living with excitement and anticipation. Notice what Jesus tells them to do. He says, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll find a catch. I wonder what the disciples thought when they heard this guy shouting out from the shoreline orders on what to do. Well, maybe, maybe they thought he knew something. Maybe he heard a fishing report. I don't know. Maybe he thought, uh, I wonder if somebody was beginning to get suspicious. Like, maybe this is starting to look like something that happened about three years ago to us. Um, Maybe. Either way, they went ahead and took the instructions and did it. They obeyed. And as a result of obedience, 
they received an overwhelming supply, a uh, surprise. They caught a huge catch of fish. So big they couldn't get it into the boat. From verse 8, we learned that this was a little boat, and it already had seven men in it. And so now they're trying to get this catch of all these fish also into the boat. I, uh, you know, in my mind, thinking fishing stuff and curious about the details, I couldn't find a study done on this, but I dug around a little bit just to try to put some numbers here. Again, there are types of fish varieties there in the uh, Sea of Galilee, but perhaps it was a type of tilapia. Tilapia, you can find them in stores around here. They're not huge, but you can catch a two-pound tilapia. And uh, so let's say 153 fish. You say, how, how do they know the exact? Well, John is an eyewitness, and you know fishermen. Like, That's an amazing catch. How many are in there? 153, to be exact. So John knows there's 153 fish. Let's say they're about two pounds. There are over 300 pounds of fish, wriggling fish in this one catch. But it says in verse 11 that these are not average or decent-sized fish, but large fish. You know, you can see some guys holding tilapia up to nine pounds. Let's say seven, eight, nine pounds. If these are large fish that get these guys all excited, we're talking about a thousand pounds of fish in this one catch. And uh, in seven guys in a little boat and a thousand pounds of fish, give or take, trying to drag it in. What an interesting uh, situation. And sometimes we wonder, you know, why did John outrun Peter to the tomb? Is John faster than Peter? Is Peter kind of a hefty guy? Well, notice in the story that Peter's actually going to drag these fish over in the nets. So if you could think about dragging even 300 pounds of fish, but upwards of 1,000 pounds, like Peter's got to be a pretty stocky guy. He's probably a pretty stocky guy. But we see this is a large catch. And that's if they are tilapia. There are other larger species of fish in the Sea of Galilee, so maybe even more. But amongst all this chaos, again, this was so significant, we got these guys all excited. But we need to see in verse 7 that John recognized Jesus. It took him a while, but finally John recognized the one on the shore had to be Jesus. John probably had a flashback to that scene earlier in his life, about three years earlier, three, three and a half years earlier. It was, it was recorded in Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm going to read Luke 5, verses 1 through 11, that records the story of what happened when Jesus first called these fishermen away from their fishing business. He said, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Again, same, same body of water, Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked them to put out a little bit from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Sounds like a familiar story, doesn't it? You can see kind of that flashback value in their minds. 
Jesus wanted to get these guys' attention. And if you want to get a guy's attention, start talking fishing. <laughs> start doing something spectacular on a fishing trip, and that'll get guys really to talking and thinking. It'll get their attention. In fact, just because of a large catch of fish, Peter falls down before Jesus and you know, says, go away from me, Lord. I am, I am a sinful man. Like It had a spiritual impact in his life. The catch was that amazing back in Luke chapter 5. Well, here we find it again. Here we find it again. Familiar to John enough. He was there. And he says to, to Peter, it's the Lord. We find Peter swam to Jesus. He couldn't wait to get there. Rather than struggling with all this fish, he just put on his outer garment. He had taken it off for work. He put it back on. He jumped in the water and swam. Threw himself into the sea. That's kind of a funny way of terming it. And in he goes. You say, why did he put his outer garment on? Again, again, we just don't really know. But maybe he didn't want to be standing there in front of Jesus with just his undergarments on, you know, <laughs> dripping hair and beard, like, oh, good to see you again, Master. <laughs> maybe, he just, he, maybe he actually was thinking ahead. Or maybe he wasn't thinking ahead, and he just put his clothes on and jumped into the water. Either way, he made it there. I don't know if he actually beat the boat with the other guys, but you see his excitement to go see Jesus. And there he is, standing there, soaking wet, when he and when the others arrived at shore, notice what it says in verse 9, what we find here, Jesus was cooking breakfast. He had a fire going, food already on it. How nice this would have been after a long night of hard work coming up empty-handed. Peter was probably a bit chilled from his early morning dip, standing there, wet clothes, wet hair, wet beard. How nice to have a fire going. But as we look at this scene, Again, there are several things that probably brought these flashbacks back to mind. Again, a miraculous catch of fish after a, a long night of catching nothing. It's like, man, that never happens. Well, it happened that one time. Yeah, that one time Jesus did the same thing. We have fish and loaves. Did you notice what he was cooking? He was cooking fish, and then there were loaves already, loaves of bread for breakfast. You know, that could have reminded him as they looked up to the eastern side of that lake into the hills, like, ah, that's where Jesus multiplied the loaves and fish to feed over 5,000 people. And specifically for Peter, he was warming himself and trying to dry off by a charcoal fire. Imagine the flashback, because the only other time we see John mention a charcoal fire was in the the courtyard of the high priest's residence where Peter was warming himself with the guards on the night Jesus was betrayed, where he denied Jesus. And it was there that he denied Jesus that third time and they made eye contact. So here's Peter around a charcoal fire warming himself yet again. I'm sure this scene was meaningful to these men in many ways. But what should have been really meaningful to them, we see in verse 12, Jesus invited them to eat breakfast with them, with him. <clears throat> you ever had fish for breakfast? Some of you are like, no. Rand says, no. <laughs> never. Some of us would never have fish, let alone for breakfast. It's actually a great breakfast. I have fond memories of camping with my grandpa and family and uh, going out early in the morning, it's cold, catching some trout out of a high mountain lake, bringing it back and pan frying it over a campfire. I'm telling you, it is. I mean, Jesus could have done anything for these guys and of all that he could have prepared, you know, that the creator of the universe could have prepared any breakfast for these guys and he chooses fish. Now, he didn't fry potatoes like that would have been, you know, pretty nice. But <laughs> bread, that's the... Breakfast of champions, champions of the faith, we could say. This is, this is what they eat. This is what Jesus makes for breakfast. But we have the Son of God, the one through whom all things were made, the creator of the universe, cooking breakfast for these disciples, serving breakfast. Notice who gives it to them. 
Jesus does. And so they sit down and eat together. Unbelievable. What an incredible day. You know, we learn something about Jesus here. He cares not only for the spiritual condition of a person, but the physical condition. They're cold from a long night of work, and Peter being wet, he made a fire. They were hungry from a long night of work. He cooked them food. They were discouraged from catching nothing. He provided an overwhelming abundance in their catch. Jesus cares for the physical as well. But what a day. It started by them out on their own, doing their own thing, not in the right place, not waiting for Jesus on a mountain, instead going below sea level to this lake, going back to their old way of life. Jesus confronts them, tells them what to do. They obey. They have a record-breaking catch, and they come back to shore. Breakfast is already ready by a warm fire, and they enjoy breakfast together. You know, as we come back next time, we're going to see that this also was a time of preparation for Jesus to confront Peter, to reaffirm his calling and apostleship. Uh, But this was not only a preparation for Peter, it taught them all some lessons, and I believe it teaches us some lessons as well. Lessons about responsibilities as a disciple. These guys were called from fishing to become fishers of men. They keep wanting to go back, doing what they were called away from. But there are some things that I think we can learn here in this as well. Let's finally, in conclusion, look at the significance What does this mean for us? Three principles we can learn as it relates to being fishermen of men, fishers of men. First of all, in order to have success, we must obey God and follow His leading. Remember, they caught no fish on their own. As skilled, as able, as equipped in such a great fishery, But not doing what God wants them to do and doing it in their own strength, they came up with nothing but failure. When they were obedient, when they followed His command, they were even doing the same activity, but just simply listening to the command of Jesus and obeying. Cast your net on the other side of the boat. They found success. You realize success for these guys was only a boat width away from them? Going from nothing to having everything? A boat with the way. Sometimes that's us. What we need, satisfaction, fulfillment, success, it's so close. But we just need to listen to Jesus and then obey what he says. Jesus, if we we can have success when we obey him and follow his leading. Second principle, Jesus desires close, intimate, fellowship with his disciples. What did Jesus do in this story? He made breakfast for them. He served them. He dined with them. Jesus wants to spend time with us each day, if possible. I say if possible. If it's not possible, it's not because Jesus is not showing up. It's always on us. He's always there, always waiting. It's you and me. We either make time and give him that time or we don't. But Jesus is our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our God. Yes. But remember, he called them. He's like, no longer are you slaves. You are my friends. He wants to be a friend. He wants to make you breakfast, as it were, and serve it to you and dine with you. It's just the picture of that close, intimate fellowship he desires with us. So let's give that to him. And third and finally, we learn Jesus wants his disciples to be fishers of men. Though John did not record the first time this miracle happened, about three years earlier when Jesus called them out of fishing to become fishers of men, John wrote his book after Luke wrote his book. John knew it was already on record. He wasn't going to take up the other portion of his book to include another miracle. He had the seven selected he wanted to record. But drawing from the greater knowledge of Jesus' ministry, he just 
records this one that was meant, I believe, to shock those disciples into remembrance of their greatest and highest calling. These guys were to go and catch people vocationally. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you are to be catching people for Him. You know, He may or may not call you to do that vocationally as your job, but either way, you are to be doing that as a disciple. And if you want to think about it in in fishing terms, if we are fishers of men and we live in this world, the ocean is all around us. Um, He's called you to fish a certain spot. You have unique access to a specific spot that he wants you to fish for him. You know, not everybody can access that special spot that you have. Maybe it's at your workplace or in your home with your family members, or maybe it's in your school, in your community, within a group of people that are your friends that share the same hobbies with you. Whatever it is, you know you know that fishing spot that he has given you. And whether or not he's called you to do it vocationally, you are, even through your vocation, through your job, through your environment, to catch people for him. Make sure you lean on him. You ask him exactly where to cast the net. And as you do and as you obey, you better hold on. And the nice thing to remember about fishing for men when you're doing this, it's better than fishing for fish, but when you catch them, he'll clean them. And that's always a bonus, isn't it? Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for your grace that allowed us to be caught by you. And now we become these fishers of men. Help us not to lose track of that responsibility in our lives. Help us not to stray from what you have called us to do in life and who you've called us to be. Help us not to be going out in our own strength or straying, but to just come to you, to listen for your voice, to obey what you say, and see the excitement and the abundance, the joy, the satisfaction. Even with these guys, a catch so big, the nets would have normally broke, but you supernaturally even held all that together. But Lord, we pray for each one here that you would help us to know what you want us to do, that we would lean upon you for our strength, and that as we go out to try to draw people to you, to catch them for you, we pray for great success for your glory. We also pray again for a great Mother's Day for everyone here. And uh, may you bring blessing to your glory, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you all for being here with us today. We will carry on, Lord willing, next week to the next passage. So we'll see you all there, if not sooner. May God bless you all. We are dismissed.